Hey folks, check out the world's weakest Mac Mini. This baby boasts a puny 32-bit core solo processor clocking in at a measly 1.5 gigahertz. Yep, you heard that right. Not even a core duo or core two duo, but a core solo. We're talking first gen Intel Mac Mini here, folks. Now you might be thinking to yourself, no way, a G4 Mac Mini would be way slower than this. And you'd be right, if we were only talking about CPU power. But get this, the G4 Mac Mini actually has a real graphics card with dedicated memory inside of it. Our weakling here, on the other hand, is stuck with a crummy GMA950 integrated graphics chip. And let me tell you, that chip is straight up garbage for gaming. So yeah, the G4 may be slower overall, but when it comes to gaming, this little guy is the bottom of the barrel. No contest. So why even bother? Well, for starters, any game that will run on this computer will run on any Intel Mac. What I have here is the absolute baseline when it comes to Intel Macs. But that's not to say this computer isn't upgradable, quite the contrary. You can upgrade the RAM, the hard drive, and even the CPU, bringing it up to a 64-bit Core 2 Duo. Another bonus is that this computer cost a fraction of the price that a Raspberry Pi currently does, where I got my unit here for just five bucks, but they regularly sell on eBay for around 20 to 50 bucks. So in this video, I'll be running through a ton of games and talk about how they perform and any special hoops I had to jump through to get them running in Mac OS 10.6.8 Snow Leopard. First, I'll go over some AAA games, then some indie games, and I'll finish up with some emulation. Let's start out today with the classic game Quake. The Mac version of Quake was originally released for Mac back in 1997 for Mac OS 8. So in order to get it running in OS 10, I used the Quake 1.2.1 port by Axel Weffers. This port allowed me to play using software rendering with a perfect frame rate using the 2x2 blit mode at either 1024 by 768 or even 720p. The 1x1 blit mode gives you a sharper image but slows down the game to about 30 to 45 frames per second. I also tried out the OS 10 port of GL Quake and that runs great as well at 1024 by 768. I did notice some screen tearing that I couldn't get rid of, but it wasn't too bad. Barely even noticeable when I hooked it up to a CRT. If I had to choose between the two ports, I would choose the original software rendering. I like the look of it a lot better, where a lot of the gritty textures seem to get lost more on the GL port. Plus, software rendering is how I used to play back in the day, so that's probably got something to do with it. Something I noticed in my experiments is that my capture card doesn't want to play nice with the GMA950. A lot of the time, these 3D games capture a lot darker than they are in real life. It's not this dark in person. But overall, both versions of Quake are very playable on this computer. Moving on, I decided to test Quake 3's performance on this computer. Since it's not natively supported in OS X, I opted for an unofficial port of IO Quake 3 designed for Intel Macs. In terms of gameplay, it was relatively smooth at 1024 by 768 While I claim to run around 90 frames per second, the Mac Mini's HDMI output is limited to 60 Hz. However, when I tried it out on a CRT using the VGA adapter, the difference was remarkable. Even at 800 by 600 resolution, the game looked fantastic and played well. And the higher refresh rates really helped with this fast-paced game. Unfortunately, I still encountered some screen tearing issues that I couldn't fix. Despite this, Quake 3 remains very playable on the system. The next game I decided to test was Alice which I was initially worried wouldn't run well on the system. Despite my concerns, Alice actually ran surprisingly well on the Mac Mini. I was able to max out the graphics settings at 1024 by 768, and everything still ran smoothly. Once again, I did notice some minor screen tearing, which seems to be a common issue with this graphics chip. But overall, the game still felt like a very smooth experience. With this kind of performance, I could definitely see myself playing through the entire game on this system. Let's move on to testing out another game on the Quake 3 engine, Return to Castle Wolfenstein. At first, I tried out the standard PowerPC binary, but unfortunately, it didn't run well at all. However, after some research, I came across a native Intel binary created by a guy named Bradman, which I found on SourceForge. The native binary drastically improved the game's frame rate, allowing me to keep a steady frame rate while maxing out the graphics settings at 800 by 600, with everything set on high and extra. It was apparent by now that the GMA950 seems to have a tendency towards screen tearing, which persisted despite enabling VSync. 
Additionally, I encountered a strange issue while using the Intel binary. Any adjustments to graphical settings resulted in a gamma problem, which could only be resolved by resetting the video output in the console or rebooting the game. Although these issues were frustrating, they were manageable until I encountered a more significant problem. The game would unexpectedly crash while adjusting settings in the menu, which for me is unacceptable. In particular, it seemed to crash when I attempted to save my progress, and because of this, I wouldn't even consider playing this game on the system when there's a risk of losing your progress. Screw that. For my next test, I decided to give the original Unreal a shot. I had fond memories of playing this game on my old Power Mac 6500 with a Sonnet G3 upgrade and a PCI Voodoo 3 3000. It was one of my favorite games back then, and it ran like a dream. However, on this system, I was disappointed to find that the frame rate wasn't quite up to par when running at 1024 by 768 So I dropped it down to 800 by 600 which is what you're seeing in this footage. While I did have to lower the resolution, the game was still very playable on this system. That being said, it's worth noting that Unreal was originally released in 1998, and given its age, you might expect that it would run flawlessly on any computer from the 2000s or later, even if it had to go through the Rosetta layer. However, that's not quite the case here, and I personally wouldn't recommend playing it on this system when there are so many better ways out there. Well, you can't play Unreal without also playing Unreal Tournament, so I decided to give it a try on this system. And after some research, I learned that there was a CIDR port available for Intel Max, which CIDR is a wrapper that allows you to run Windows games on Intel Max. Initially, I was excited about the prospect of being able to play this game on the system as the intro ran at a nice frame rate and looked really good. However, as soon as I got in-game, I discovered that the port suffers from intense hiccups where the game would freeze every couple of seconds, making it unplayable on the system. I suspect this is due to a lack of video memory. I experimented with various video options and resolutions, but nothing seemed to work. Eventually, I gave up on the CIDR port and moved on to an OS X PowerPC build of the app, hoping for better results. The problem with that is that Unreal Tournament has no installer for OS X, so I had to manually transfer all of the game files from the CD and place them in a folder alongside the OS X application. Despite the hassle, the game performed decently at 800 by 600 resolution. However, to be clear, the term decently in this context means it was only suitable for playing against computer-controlled bots. I wouldn't be challenging any of you guys to a match with this computer. For me, fast-paced shooters demand a consistently high and smooth frame rate, and unfortunately, that is simply not achievable on this system. So for fun, next I decided to try installing Unreal 2004 on this system. I have a soft spot for this game, but unfortunately, as you'd expect, it runs terribly on this machine. The game was originally released as a PowerPC-only binary on Mac, but later, an update was released that turned it into a universal binary, which means it could run natively on Intel Macs. However, even with the update, the game is simply unplayable on the system. I tried turning down the graphics to the point where you'd swear it was running on an N64, but it still wasn't enough to make it playable. The game starts up, but the frame rate is so low, it's impossible to enjoy. I decided to move on to another classic shooter, Max Payne. This fantastic game was originally released for PowerPC Max back in 2002. Now, just to warn you, my capture card did not do a good job capturing the gameplay footage. It made it look way darker than it actually is. Initially, I tried running the game at 1024 by 768 with the medium graphics quality preset, and it ran decently. However, it was too choppy for my liking in the larger areas of the game. Thankfully, most of the game takes place in small rooms and hallways. To improve performance, I dropped the resolution down to 640x480, and now the game runs similarly to the PS2 port. But, in my opinion, it's still too choppy for me. I'm quite picky when it comes to this game. While it certainly is playable on this system, there are better options available these days. I would recommend playing it on a modern PC or Xbox, or the PS4 version if you don't mind the low frame rate. If you prefer to play with the controller, I would recommend the Xbox version. But if you have a more powerful Mac than the world's weakest, then the Mac version is also an option. Continuing my exploration of classic games on Mac, I decided to give the Mac port of Red Faction a try. To my surprise, despite being a PowerPC app, 
It ran better than any of the other first-person shooters I had tested earlier. I was impressed that I could max out both the graphics settings and resolution at 1024 by 768 and the game ran without any hiccups. The gameplay was smooth and the frame rate was consistent throughout. It was a refreshing change from most of the other games I tried today. Red Faction was an incredible game that I had enjoyed playing through multiple times in the past. With its destructible environments and engaging storyline, it was ahead of its time when it was released. If you're looking for a classic shooter, I would highly recommend giving Red Faction a try. Absolutely playable on this system. Alright, so it's time to try something a little different. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. Although the Mac version of Tony Hawk games went all the way up to Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4, unfortunately, the latter doesn't work well on systems newer than OS 10.4. Therefore, for this video, I decided to go with Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2, a game that I thoroughly enjoyed in the past. Surprisingly, it plays quite well on an Intel Mac, even though it's not at 60 frames per second. Very playable in my opinion. The only issue I faced was that the gamepad didn't work right off the bat. Maybe if I tinkered with it a bit more or tried a different one, I could have got it working. But for now, in this footage, I am playing the game with the keyboard, which I must say is quite challenging. For this video, I experimented with two different resolutions, 1024 by 768 and 640 by 480 I found that the game looks pretty similar in both, with slightly more aliasing on the edges in the lower resolution, and a minor boost in frames per second. Great game. The last AAA game I wanted to try was the original Halo. I didn't have high expectations for this game because it's a massive and complex game for its time. However, it was released as a native Intel Mac game around the time that this Mac Mini was released, so I wanted to give it a try. Surprisingly, the game ran well at 1024 by 768 It only struggled in areas with heavy gunfire, causing the frame rate to drop. I tried the game at three different resolutions, 1024 by 768 800 by 600 and 640 by 480 and I was pleasantly surprised that they weren't as bad as I expected. Although I wouldn't choose to play the game on this system today, I have to admit that if I had this Mac Mini back in the day, I would have probably played through the entire game looking like this. Alright, let's move on to some indie games, starting with a Mac specific classic, Return to Dark Castle. This is the third installment in the Dark Castle series, released in 2008, with the first two installments dating back to the 1980s. It features all of the stages from the original two games, as well as a plethora of original stages. The player's goal is to find magic orbs throughout the land, and return them to the main room to unlock the door to the final battle with the Black Knight. You'll battle all sorts of monsters, figure out all kinds of puzzles, it's an excellent game. The thing about this game is it's no longer playable on current Macs. A few years ago, Apple discontinued support for 32-bit apps, and unfortunately, as of this video, the game has not been updated, making the only way to play this one being on an older Mac. Using a Mac like this one is the most affordable and convenient way to experience this fantastic game, in my opinion. It runs the game 100% perfectly. As previously mentioned, this computer only costs between $20 to $50, which is a reasonable price to pay for this top-notch Mac exclusive. Next, I was curious to see how well the original PowerPC version of Sketchfighter 4000 would run on this computer, and to my delight, it performed flawlessly. This is another Macintosh exclusive game, released in 2006. It's a Metroidvania style space shooter with a comic sketch aesthetic. You control a ship and explore different areas or zones. And as you progress, you have to fight different enemies, picking up power-ups like new weapons, better shields, and faster engines. Some power-ups are given as rewards for defeating bosses or exploring new areas. It's a very interesting and unique game. I did an entire video dedicated to this game if you want to know more about it. Moving on, I decided to test out Payback, a Grand Theft Auto style game for Mac that was developed by Apex Designs and released back in 2003. Interestingly, Payback was initially released for the Amiga back in 2001 and was later ported to Mac. If you're familiar with the original Grand Theft Auto game, you'll feel right at home with the gameplay in Payback. You control a character who roams around the city, completing missions from payphones, stealing cars, and committing other crimes. Although the game has aged, I still find it enjoyable to play in short bursts. It boasts better graphics than the official Grand Theft Auto game, and was considered very impressive when it was released back in the day. 
Moving on, I have a ball rolling style platforming game to share with you. It goes by the name Marble Blast Gold. If you played the Xbox 360 arcade game Marble Blast Ultra, you might find this game familiar as it's the original version of the game released before the Xbox counterpart. The goal of the game is very simple. You guide a marble through various obstacles to reach the exit at the end of the stage. Some stages require you to collect gems before the exit is unlocked. This version of the game includes all of the power-ups present in the Xbox version, albeit with slightly lower graphics quality. I found that playing the game at 800 by 600 resolution worked best on this system. Absolutely playable on this computer, and I highly recommend it. Next, I wanted to introduce you to a game that I've been a fan of for quite some time now. Released in 2000 by Jonas Esterhoff, Reckless Driving is a top-down driving game that I think you'll enjoy if you played games like Spy Hunter or Bump and Jump. The objective of the game is to reach the end of the stage while causing as much chaos as possible. You'll get points for hitting animals, blowing up cars, and reaching the end of the track as fast as possible. Meanwhile, the police will relentlessly chase you. What I love about this game is its fun gameplay and neat physics. This is a power PC game running under Rosetta, which does the job fairly well. I did notice some minor glitches in the menus, but the gameplay itself is perfect. I absolutely recommend giving this game a try. Moving on, we have a classic space shooter called Meteor Storm, created by Zsculpt, the same author behind Return to Dark Castle. While the game was originally released back in 1996, it has been updated over the years to remain compatible with current Mac systems. The game's premise is simple, shoot everything in your way. It starts off slow, but becomes increasingly challenging as you progress through the waves. To make things more interesting, you'll face bosses every few waves. However, there's a catch. You only have one life, which means that you need to manage your shields carefully. Let's move on to some emulators, starting with a classic gaming staple, the NES. For the NES on Mac, I've always used the Mac port of the Nestopia emulator. It was expertly ported to the Mac by Richard Bannister, a highly skilled coder who has brought many emulators to the Mac platform. Nestopia runs flawlessly on this system, and it can handle most of the games you throw at it with support for over 200 mappers. Next up for SNES emulation, Richard's port of BSNES offers three different applications depending on how you want to run your game. Its main focus is on running games as accurately as possible, but unfortunately, it runs quite slow on this system. The performance application is the only one I found playable, but it still has some slowdown issues. Instead, I opted to try out the Mac port of SNES 9X, which is a reliable option for SNES emulation on this system. It maintains a steady 60 FPS and performs well overall. Next, I wanted to test Sega Genesis emulation on this computer. To accomplish this, I chose the Kega Fusion emulator. This emulator is capable of handling Genesis, Master System, Game Gear, 32X, and Sega CD games. Although I only tried the Genesis, I assume that the other platforms will perform similarly. The emulation runs smoothly at a consistent 60 frames per second throughout. Kega Fusion is an excellent emulator that requires minimal effort to set up, and it runs very well. I thoroughly enjoyed using it. I wanted to test the limits of this computer by attempting to emulate N64, but there aren't many good N64 emulators for this system. One of the options is an app called 60 Force, which is a paid emulator that requires a hefty sum to unlock save states and remove the giant watermark on the screen. Despite this, 60 Force emulation runs well using the standard graphics mode. I tested the high quality mode and I got about 10 frames per second but the standard mode was playable at around 30 frames per second. The only other option for N64 emulation, that I know of anyways, is the command line based emulator Mupin64+. Plus. It runs smoothly, but I couldn't figure out how to configure the gamepad or get it to run in full screen mode. RetroArch could be a solution, but they currently don't offer a 32-bit macOS build. Though they do offer the source and instructions on how to build it yourself, which I might try in the future as it sports mini emulators. Alright, moving on, we need to know how MAME works on this system. The flavor of MAME I tried here was one simply called MAME OS X. It's got a user-friendly interface where it shows your games in a little window, and all you gotta do is double-click on one and it fires it up. I tried three games on it and I had no issues. The frame rate was perfect, even when upscaled to 1080p. It supports joysticks without any additional setup and is an effortless way to play arcade games on this system. Not too shabby. 
Alright, to round off this video, I wanted to see how well this system can play DOS games. And for that, I opted for a version of DOSBox called Boxer. This is an outstanding implementation of DOSBox that makes it incredibly easy to install your games. It even guides you through the setup process and organizes your games onto a virtual shelf on your hard drive. So cool. The program is incredibly user-friendly and allows you to set the speed or cycles with a simple slider that has pre-marked settings for systems like a 386, a 486, or a Pentium. It's so easy to use. All the games I've tried run at full speed on the system. Boxer opens up a whole new world of gaming on the system and it's absolutely amazing. So in conclusion, would I recommend this computer for classic gaming? If you're mainly interested in playing Mac indie games from the 2000s, or dabbling with emulation of older computers or consoles from the 80s and 90s, this would be an excellent computer for that purpose. Its compact size and built-in DVD burner make it a practical option for many scenarios, particularly where a larger PC may not be ideal. Additionally, the macOS operating system is exceptionally user-friendly and makes using this computer a breeze. Plus, this computer is capable of running Boot Camp, allowing you to install Windows XP and gain access to thousands more games, potentially providing better performance than what was showcased in this video. Overall, there are plenty of possibilities with a computer like this, so if you can find one at a reasonable price, ideally under $50, I would certainly recommend it. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like on it to let me know. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my little channel here. I make videos about the obscure world of Mac gaming with a perspective you won't get anywhere else. Thanks so much for your time today, guys. Goodbye.